tone chaser. That thing you hear in your head that you just can't quite get. We audition on other people's equipment. <laughs> and I forgot the songs that we played. We never got a job, first of all. But uh, I completely trashed the guy's drum set. <laughs> I don't think he liked me for, <laughs> too much for that. Not like a keep moon, huh? Well, I didn't do it on purpose. I just like to bash away on things, and his stuff just wasn't really capable of handling it. So, well, by the time I left, let's just say I wasn't exactly the most likable or liked guy in town. <laughs> I used to do all kinds of crazy shit. What else did you do? Well, now Mark Mark Stone is still playing bass now. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't until later that uh, <laughs> when we finally did become established on the, if you want to call it the Hollywood uh, circuit, so to speak, or Gazars in particular, it wasn't until then that we really had any steady work of any kind. It was just it was music comes. It was. Where did the um? I mean, I know you guys played a lot of those gigs that passed in the Civic, and you drew like. Okay, well that came afterwards. First of all, okay. what we did was uh, we started working regularly at Gazzari's. Okay, you, you, you were playing at these miscellaneous clubs in Pasadena with Mark Stone and just getting the game. No, no clubs with Mark Stone. No clubs with Mark Stone. I think we actually won. I can't remember the name of the place, but it was out in probably Mexico somewhere. So it was mainly then these backyard parties Correct. and beer bus. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Then Roth came into the picture, okay, and we got rid of Pusey. Oh, he's still in the band too. Yeah, Pusey okay. was in the band. Yeah, let me, let me start off just very simply so you can remember. Okay, first it was Ed, Mark, and I. We went through a number of uh, singing auditions, including Mark Stone's brother, his name is Brad. Nothing ever worked out. Then we got Jim Pusey. One of the reasons was that he, his family owned the dance school and we were allowed to use the dance floor as a rehearsal area. But he was also a damn good player. Musically, he was great. The sound he got out of that thing was disgusting. Then we finally got Roth into the band after all the stuff that I told you before. Right. And we get to a point where we felt that it was not going to work out with Pusey. So we had to tell him, sorry, uh, things just aren't working out. Now again, you're always the, uh, the diplomat in the situation. Well, yeah, yeah it, was, it was Roth and I who walked over to uh, Pusey's place. Can I take a leak real quick? Yeah. It was Roth and I who walked over to Pusey's place and I had to tell him. And I felt like shit having to tell him this stuff. I, had, you know, I didn't know what to say. I said, Jim, I'm sorry, but things just aren't working out. You know, he was actually more apologetic than we were. Hmm. He said, yeah, okay, I understand. And he just got kind of quiet and walked away. I love these things in ice cream. Ice cream? Gary's out. I wasn't working with Gary. Who? Gary Pusey. No, it was, um... We were just talking about the keyboard player. Yeah, I know, but his name wasn't Gary. Oh, I'm sorry. Jim. Jim, sorry. Jim Pusey. So the band starts working and working and working and playing okay, now, any and all any and all high school dances, college dances. We played at UCLA, I remember one time. Uh, just anything and everything that we could find. This is Dave and, and Mark Sill. Yeah. As Van Halen. Right. Okay. Then we started becoming more or less of a house band at Gazzari's. So Gazzari's was the first pretty major... Yeah. I would say so. It was it was the first real uh, steady type work. So you had gone back. You'd already auditioned at Gazzari's and been turned down. Right. What what was a change that? Uh... Um, I think the selection of the music uh, was more danceable. Again, like I said, Ed and I wanted to jam. We would go into these long cream uh, solos, and uh, well, it was great musically. But from a dance standpoint, it just wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. See, this is where Roth was good, because he was very in tune as to what the audience would like to dance to. 
Ed and I don't, weren't really into dancing or any of that stuff. We wanted to make music. <laughs> you know, we wanted to play the Palladium. We wanted to play at yeah, Wembley Arena. <laughs> we wanted to do that kind of thing. But uh, slowly but surely, we got into more uh, average public uh, accessibility, if you mm -hmm. want to call it that. Mm -hmm. So we started playing more Top 40. We started doing a little of this, but still throwing our own, uh, well, let's say this, our own Van Halenism into it. Mm -hmm. A song that we did would never sound the same as it did on the record. Mm -hmm. When we played Smoke on the Water, I mean, it was smoke on the Atlantic Ocean, you know what I mean? It was big stuff. Mm -hmm. And after, uh, well, after a few months, uh, we had steady work at Gazari's. Uh, I don't want to bad rap anybody, but the reason that we had to let Mark go was that uh, it seemed that his interests were elsewhere than music. He seemed to be more interested in, in uh, what his parents forced him to do. You have to remember, we're pretty young at this time. And How old are you guys now? Well, about 18. <laughs> Which was illegal to be working in a club where they served liquor. <laughs> uh, no, so we had to let Mark go, and what happened was uh, we were doing a show at a place called Pasadena High School, and this was our first real, full-fledged, big stage production concert, so to speak. Right. And this is after you've been playing Uh I, I, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, probably. This, this all happened basically around the same time, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a matter of uh, days difference. So we get there, and shit, man, lo and behold, the PA blows up. Into the picture steps Michael Anthony, whose band named Snake has a PA, and he offered us the use of his PA. They, they were playing on the same show? Yeah. They were opening up for us. So after our PA blew up during a sound check, now, like I said, Mike uh, offered the use of his PA. There's no charge. So we figured, hey, what the hell? This is sound really great. So anyway, that's how we first met Mike. Hmm. Uh, what what was what were your and Edward's uh, feelings about Mike? I and mean, then just meeting him, or do you remember? Uh, he was he was a really energetic performer. He had a great voice. Um, I didn't care too much for the rest of his band. Who else was in his band? I don't remember. Okay. I just remember not. Yeah. What, what kind of stuff were they doing? Uh, ZZ Top. Uh, just rock and roll. But Mike was really, uh, he was the lead singer also. Right. Bass player, lead singer. And uh, I was very impressed by him. He's, he's Mike Sobolewski at this point, right? Right. So uh, again, you know, it, got, it got to the point where uh, it became really difficult to work with Mark. And you know, I love the guy. If you're gonna print anything, print that because I love the guy. He's really great. He's a great personality, great guy to be with, and he had a great sound, but uh, it just did not work out. So at one time we uh, got together, it was Dave, Michael Anthony, or Michael Soboleski at that time, Ed and myself, and we played in the garage that we, uh, that we rehearsed in. And just right off the bat we, we hit it off. I mean, who, who approached Mike's? To, I mean, he had his own band. I mean, what, what would make sense? We did. I, I can't remember who, who in particular, but we just approached him. Um, uh, whether, I think it was Ed or me. And we called him up and said, come on down and why don't we play a little bit. Did Mike and, know about Van Halen, the band? I'm sure he knew about the band. I don't know that he knew what, uh, what the reason or purpose was for, mm -hmm. for him to come down and play. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, he came down, we played, and we said, hey, shit, this is it. And then, uh, again, it was my fucking job to sit there and have to tell Mark. And I felt like, <laughs> such, a, I felt like such a piece of shit. So they were, I'll never forget, we were sitting out in the back of Roth's backyard, and Mike says, well, can't you just give me one more chance? And you know, I just, I had no alternative but to say, I'm sorry, man. Every, everybody fucks up, and I feel bad because I've fucked up before. In the 11 years that we were together, I've gotten drunk on stage twice. 
And believe me, it's no fun <laughs> to have everybody sit there, point the finger at you, and say, hey, asshole, you fucked up. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> hmm. So would Edward just feel uncomfortable being the one to do the dismissing? or was it just uh, He would just basically uh, just say, Al, you do it. And, well, it had to be done. So we did it. Hmm. So do you have an idea what time period this is? This is when um, the name of the band, Van Halen, started to actually be uh, recognized around the city. This is when things were really starting to uh, kind of come together, if you want to call it that. I mean, if you call making five dollars a night a piece come together, well, then that's it. <laughs> so then, did, did you go back to Gazzari's then with Mike? Yeah. We we playing other clubs. We being able. Yeah, we started. We started to get more work in you know places like uh, Rock Corporation, Walter Mitty's. I think I already mentioned these names, but right. places like that. We just. After a while, it became basically working six days a week at these various clubs, and we just had our hands full. And we just blazed away for five hours a night. Hmm. Was Mike initially just playing bass, or was he singing? Did he come singing. in? Singing. One of the first songs that we ever did is something we've never recorded before. It was called a song. It's a song called "She's the Woman," and Mike was doing some harmonies on it. And man, that guy's voice. <laughs> Unbelievable! Really? Yeah. I mean, were there ever ever any thoughts of, of Mike singing lead or anything like that? Or? No. No. His uh, his voice is too thin. Mm -hmm. And again, he's uh, he's playing an instrument. Mm -hmm. It's always been our feeling that we need somebody out front who can uh, be the focal point. Right. It's nice to have somebody who can also play an instrument. Right. Like well, in the situation we're in now, you know, Sammy can play guitar, Ned can play keyboards, mm -hmm. but you know. Mm -hmm. 90% of the time he's going to be out there being the front man, right. being the focal point. Right. Were you doing, well you mentioned she's a woman, so you were doing original. Oh yeah, so, we always. You, uh, you know, oh yeah. Kind of stuck original All, always. We so, were always. She's a woman, one of the first original things that you guys did? Wrote, yeah. As a matter of fact, we did a demo, I think, uh, I forget the year and date, but it was quite a while ago. And it was with... Uh, Shit, no, I can't remember whether Mike was playing or whether Mark was playing. It was a, playing, a place called Groundhog Studios. Really? It was, a, it was a hound dog. Hound dog or ground dog, one of them. It was in Pasadena, some cheesy place. And uh, She's the Woman, that was one of the first ones we did. Really? Were there any other tunes that showed up on the first record? Um, no. Were these tunes that you and Edward had... Uh sort of put together? I mean, was, was Dave involved in any of this at all? Yeah, Dave was always involved in, in the, the things. As a matter of fact, it was usually, uh, well, it was Ed who came up with all the music. And, well, since I'm not a singer, uh, I don't come up with the singing. We took a very simple approach to the whole thing. It was not as if we were to sit down and say, okay, let's write a song. It was, let's go home and play. Like, for instance, uh, Ain't Talking About Love. The whole song came together within about five minutes. Really? I, hate to, I hate to make it sound so easy. <laughs> I feel guilty. But that's how it, came. it just came about. Ed had the music, and we just played. And Roth would sing to it. And if it was good, we'd keep it. Mm -hmm. If not, somebody would say, no, I don't like that. Let's change it to this. Mm -hmm. My function as far as in, in the creative end, as far as the band making music or writing songs, is that I'll throw in my nickel's worth, I'll throw in my five cents and say, hey, I don't like this, this doesn't work. What do you think about trying this? Now, I can't hum you the specific notes, and I can't tell you exactly what, but I do, I can hear when something is not right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ted Templeman is uh, the final uh, Fine tuner, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's the one who probably helped Roth out more than anybody as far as the vocals go. You know, there's not a single record that we ever made where Roth sang from beginning to end. See? <laughs> no, he never sang one song from beginning to end. That's why he has such a, a hard time playing live, because he can't do it.
And that's why he wants to be a movie star instead of a making music. You can print that, I don't care. We, we get Go ahead, sue me, fucker. <laughs> we get beyond ourselves. We'll be there. We'll get yeah. there. So, Mike is in the band. Mm -hmm. So what, you said Mike coming over jam. Mike, you want to be in the band? Right. And he said... Yeah. Obviously. Mm -hmm. And he was just willing to let his band go and... and yeah. Because I don't, I don't think that anybody who was in that band was really seriously pursuing anything. Mm -hmm. it's, kind of, it's a strange uh, thing to describe, but I'll tell you, from the very beginning, Ed and I knew what we wanted to do, and we put everything into it. Uh, countless times our parents would sit there and say, get a fucking job, will you? You know, get out of bed. We'd be uh, sleeping until noon because we were working until 3 or 4 in the morning. Get out of bed. Get a job. Look at your cousin. He's an accountant. That type of thing. And we'd say, okay, well, just, just hold on. Just... And the only thing I think that made uh, our parents really tolerate us is the fact that maybe they could sense that there was something there more than just, uh, a, hobby. just a hobby. And also we... Uh, well, just to be able to have room and board and stay at the bed, we went to school. <laughs> so it looked like at least we did something. <laughs> mm. Mm. But anyway, so then we uh, we just sat there and we played anything and everything we could. And it was basically at this time that we started playing all the clubs. Almost uh, no more high school stuff, no more uh, backyard parties. Just clubs. So you were graduating then? Yeah if you want to call it, reaching a different plateau. Mm -hmm. And then we started promoting our own uh, our own gigs. How many of those did you do? Quite a few. Uh, we used to... What was the name of the place? Uh, International Casino. It was a converted bowling alley. And I forgot the guy's name. I remember his first name. It was Roy. Roy somebody. Who was putting on these concerts. And we'd cut a deal with him. This is like Tortomasi or something? No, no. Tortomasi came later on. Uh, there was a place called International C uh, Casino, and I think it was in Dewarty. Anyway, one of those outskirts of the outskirts. You know, Pasadena is an outskirt of L.A. Well, Dewarty is an outskirt of Pasadena. Uh, and we would uh, go to Postal Instant Press. We'd design our own little posters, and at night we would go to every high school in the area and stuff lockers. Mm. Hours on end. Usually about 10,000 of them. Wow. I mean, these people probably got sick of looking at these things because they'd be all over the place. We'd tape them up on ceilings, we'd tape them on windows, we'd put them everywhere. And, uh, well, that was basically the start. And if I say basically one more time, then I want to sit there and stick my finger in my throat. But that, that was how it got started. And more and more people started showing up. And then people like uh, Tortomasi, uh, who had more cash advance, could rent a building like the Pasadena Civic, knowing that he would draw uh, a few thousand people, so there was money for it and everybody. Hmm. So you actually started making some pretty decent money. Um, well, it was far and few between. Uh, when you do one show a month, it's not really... <laughs> Is that what it was, basically? So one concert, yeah if you want to call it a concert, compared to playing the clubs. Of course, we were playing the clubs all the You're time. You're still doing bizarres and clubs. Yeah, all those places. But uh, eventually, enough people started to come that uh, it generated some interest. Because we never really went around and peddled a, uh, a demo tape to anyone. We didn't approach the record companies and say, here, listen to this. Because what you do is you end up with the rest of the pile. You know, a pile of maybe hundreds of different people, and I'm sure a lot of it's good, Record company isn't interested in that. They're interested in cash. When they see people pay money to see band, ah, band needs to be signed. When they listen to a good piece of music, no matter how good it is, but they don't see people paying money, record company don't make money, band don't get contract. Goodbye, see you later. Hmm. Between um, Mammoth and Van Halen, was there, were there any other band names for any length of time? You mentioned Space Brothers. Right. Was there anything else in there for any length of time? Not that I can recall. No. 
I can remember the early days we had a band called TRC. TRC? Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Trojan Rubber Company. Oh, that's, that's another one. Yeah. yeah. That was in the way early days. Is this after... Uh, <laughs> this is uh, way before uh, Genesis. Right. But it's after the sound of Las Vegas. Correct. Any any other th any other band names in there? That was the one I was trying to think of. That was the one that I had seen. I'm trying to remember, but uh, no, not really. Yeah. Nothing of any consequence. Of any consequence. So, so when you guys got Gazares and you moved basically out of the Pasadena area into Hollywood, you feel that it was really something happening? Um. Now that you're on a circuit with Okay, well, let me put it this way. First of all, the first night that we ever played there, there were only four people in the audience, okay? At Gazares? There were four people, <laughs> really? and they were four of our friends <laughs> <laughs> who, we, who we paid for to get them in. <laughs> Gazari wouldn't even let us park in the parking lot. Oh, gosh. So we used to have to sneak in and hide the cars way in the back where nobody could see it. We had a, a really small parking lot. Yeah. Uh, again, it just took, it took a number of years to just build it up, and once it started to build up, and we were packing the place, uh, Gazari took a different attitude. Oh, you can park here. Took a different attitude, you know. No problem. Oh, okay. you're fine. You want a big drink? Come down and see my photo studio downstairs. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, it was really it was rough. I'd be sitting there hoping and praying on the way to the to the gig that uh, there would be people there to dance because there's nobody dancing. Here we go back to the same old thing. The so, so you got the gig at Gazari's, and what he said, you guys can come back next weekend and play? Mm hmm And then you played, and, and you got a reaction or something? Right. Or? We just started to, uh, I don't know, something just clicked. Yeah. Something clicked, and the, the audience loved it, and they got in there, and they danced, and it was, it was packed. And um, we just took it from there. Hmm. But Bill Gazari himself never thought the band was anything... No, not in the beginning. It wasn't until later that we, I think he upped our pay from 15 to $20 a night. <laughs> How much were you making at the very end? You know? um, let's see, probably about $100 a night really? to split four ways. And then expenses, of course. Like I said before, drumsticks, drum heads, guitar strings. Didn't you guys all used to drive out in some old van or something? Yeah, the old Econoline, the blue Ford Econoline. Oh, yeah. We used to pack that thing to the hilt. Uh, what year was it? Oh, God, 62, I think. An old 62. Again, this is something Ed could probably can yeah. tell you better. Who used to drive? Ed. <laughs> Ed Joe. <laughs> oh, it's his car. He oh. wouldn't let me drive it. <laughs> So you're basically you're doing these, uh, these passing the civic gigs. You're playing Gazares. Right. Um, I suppose a star with the whiskey started. Right. We started doing that, and then it's a strange thing is that uh, I got a phone call. See, we we auditioned at uh, at the whiskey, uh, and I got a phone call from uh, Bill Gazari. He said, "Look, if you're gonna work." Uh, at the whiskey right down the street, you know, it's only about a hundred yards away. He says, "Don't ever come back here again." Is that what he said, really? Was, which was at that time a big gamble for us because uh, the whiskey wasn't paying a shit, and we were doing all our own material. At uh, at Gazzari's, we had a guaranteed income, but how far can that go? So we said, "All right, well, thank you, Mr. Gazzari. Goodbye." All right. And that was it. Did you, I mean, did you discuss that with Edward? And oh, yeah, Ed, Dave, Mike, uh, we sat there and we really thought it out. And we figured, you know, it's, it's nice to sit there and have a steady, if you want to call it steady income, Jesus Christ, a hundred bucks a week. So we figured, fuck it, let's go for it. So we uh, started doing things at the whiskey. And again, it started out slow, but it, it gradually built up. Who were some of the groups that you used to play with there, do you remember? Because you probably weren't headlining. People like, uh, what's the keyboard player? Uh, Lee Michaels? Lee Michaels. Really? Yeah. Well, we headlined over him. <laughs> uh, Randy, what was his name? I got it. It was basically a situation of uh, has-beens who were there. Yeah. 
We didn't realize it at the time because we were on the way up while they were on the way down. So we were just we were impressed and we were interested and kind of knocked out by playing at the world famous Whiskey A Go Go. So when they said yes, you can come play, I mean, you guys must have been like you say. Oh so yeah, it was it was special. It was yeah a real sense because, of something happening. Yeah, because it was it was the place where it wasn't a club situation. It was more a concert situation. Mm -hmm. Even though the building itself and the room itself was very small, you were on a five to six foot stage. You had professional lighting as opposed to what we used to have, which were uh, colored uh, uh, floodlights. I didn't like to sit there and press the buttons. We had three colors. We had green, uh, blue, and red. <laughs> and Mike would sit there, and while he's sitting between playing, he'd be playing that shit. It was the first real experience we had with uh, a soundboard and mics and the whole thing. Do you remember what year this was, the first? No. I don't remember that stuff. I'm sure if I dig up uh, uh, some of the stuff, because uh, I saved all the, the oh, posters. Oh, you do. Oh, yeah. Oh, please let me. Oh, yeah, I've saved Let up. me use that stuff, won't you? Sure. Oh, great. Yeah, I've saved all the posters, and as a matter of fact, I have some, a lot of pictures and oh, uh, all kinds of shit. Great. Great. But those were the formative years. They were. Yeah. So when you moved into the whiskey, were, were you still doing cover tunes? Uh, no, not when we played at the whiskey. We were still playing places like uh, um, Walter Mitty's. Oh, you were? Oh, yeah. So you'd come into to the whiskey on a Friday or Saturday, but during the week and stuff, you still... Right. I can tell you some interesting stories, man. Walter Mitty's is a strange place. It's in a place called Pomona, Pomona. California. Now, like I said, Duarte is a suburb of Pasadena, and Pasadena is a suburb of uh, L.A. Well, Pomona is a suburb of uh, the last one I just mentioned. <laughs> it's way out there. It's out in the Thule's. But it's a great place. It's the only place where kids can get in there and you know drink beer, get rowdy, listen to music, dance, do whatever they want to do. Uh, let me give you a feeling of the ambience of the hall. You want to call it that? I think the entire capacity is probably legally about 130. Our dressing room, where we had to change our clothes, was just a bathroom. And they had a urinal there. I'll never forget this. There's a urinal there with a pipe going down. It looks like plumbing. Yeah. Well, it's not really plumbing. It's a pipe going down to the ground. Oh my God! By the middle of the evening, after people have been they're pissing all over the place. The ground gets soaked and doesn't absorb anymore, so the thing starts to back up. Every night, at the end of the evening, a layer of probably about a quarter of an inch of piss is across the entire thing. Well, you get used to it, you know? You look, you look like a pig, you know, end up whatever. <laughs> well, you get used to it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't need plush rugs. Anyway, one day, uh, after a show, or after, after a night of working, which was five hours, Five forty-five minute sets of full blaze stuff, and believe me, we didn't wow. we didn't sit there and stand. I mean, we played five hours of heavy duty rock. Well, anyway, after the thing's over, everybody's getting out. A few people are sitting in a corner by a table. I'm having a beer, you know, cigarette, and get ready to go home. And all of a sudden, there's some kind of commotion on the side. And you know, before I know it, there's two guys laying on the ground. And one guy gets up and he runs out to the he runs out the door. He come walking over to the guy who's laying on the floor. And he's got half his stomach hanging, hanging out. Apparently, the guy had used one of those bowling knives with the little yeah. things. So he had, and he yanked his stomach out. Now Ed's looking at this, and Ed kind of uh, well, he's a little squeamish. <laughs> so I told Ed, I said, "Hey, look, man, don't worry about it. It's just a flesh wound." <laughs> Well, the paramedics came uh, a little bit late, if I may add, and uh, the guy died on the way to the hospital. Did you really? Yeah. What happened was there were two bikers, and they got in an argument over whose motorcycle was faster. One guy said, hey, your Harley Davidson is a piece of shit. The other guy says, hey, man, your fucking sucky sipper Yamaha is a piece of crap. So that's when they fucking drew their knives and they got into it. So anyway, like I said, the guy croaked and whatever. The other guy ran off. 
And apparently they were from different gangs, different bike gangs. They got the guy who did the knifing, threw him in the can, who promptly got killed in the can two oh, days later. Yeah. Well, yeah, because his buds, the word spreads, you know. We were coming back to play. Now, I don't want to sit there in a place <laughs> where people are sitting there knifing each other. What the hell? You know? What the fuck am I going to do over there? So we took all the amps and we put them just about a foot behind or away from the wall. So we had at least a place to hide like this. <laughs> the bartender comes over and he says, hey, guys, you got nothing to worry about. Take a look over here. And we look behind the bar and the guy's got a shotgun, a 38, he's got knives, he's got nunchucks, you know, everything you can imagine. And I'm going, oh shit, we got to play here for a hundred dollars? God, did that freak you out? Uh, it freaked me out more than him, I think. Hmm. I think yet after a while he said, well, fuck it, we either do it or we don't. But that was, uh, that was an interesting thing. Hmm. We've had some interesting things happen. Yeah. Would Ed say things like, Alex, I think, you know, we're, we're really, things are really happening, or I think it's really going to happen, or I mean, could he, did he ever talk, I mean, was he excited about, you know, playing with the whiskey, I mean? No. Really? No. Um, like I said before, from the very beginning, um, Ed and I just knew that it was going to happen. And I think the thing to remember is that what makes us happy is not quote-unquote success. It's playing the music. That's all we were ever interested in. And if somebody's willing to listen, and if somebody's willing to, to come and see, fine. It was never a calculated thing where you say, I want to be a rock and roll superstar and I want to make a lot of money. Because then where do you go? You know? I get so you I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so you make uh, $20 million. Uh -huh. And then what? Well, what's your next goal? You want to make a goal and make $30 million? You want to make $50 million? No, it's, it's the music. It's the feeling. Very few people, and I've been fortunate, very few people get the feeling of the satisfaction of playing music and having a good time at it. There's no drug like it. I love it. I get the impression that Dave, even from the early days, was an amazingly goal-oriented guy who's, who's looked at success in terms of money and, and making more money each night and more lights and, you know... Dave was a... Uh, we're talking about the I early think, days. I think, yeah, I know. No, even in the early days. He never changed, believe me. He's a very calculating, uh, worthless piece of shit. <laughs> no, I'm serious. He's very calculating. Everything he does, whether it's from the way he ties his shoes, to the way he walks, to the way he walks into something, to the way that he presents himself on camera, is all very calculated. And from day one that we worked, and I don't mind saying this, you know, you can strike it if you want, or do whatever. I hate his guts. I did not like the guy. But he was a, he was a necessary evil, though, wasn't he? Yeah. Because he did have the, uh, I gotta hand it to me, I, there's, there's two sides to every coin. Um, he was very outgoing, very energetic, and he was by no means stupid. He was very articulate. He uh, he tried anything and everything that uh, kind of fancied his interest. You know, anywhere from whitewater rafting to roller skating to you name it. None of which which he ever really accomplished or did. As a matter of fact, <laughs> he had a nice slut with that doggone raft of his for nine months. That thing started to stink after a while. But uh, I think it was a good, a good um, influence on us, as far as from the standpoint of Roth was an he was an achiever. Mm -hmm. He wants to do something. If it was left up to Ed and I, we'd probably end up in the studio and have the greatest music, right. and he would just be sitting there. I can see that eleven years later, he'd still be in the studio making this great music that right. no one in the world ever would have heard. Right. Now, Roth and I used to handle all the business uh, in the early days, 
And later on, uh, we left it over to the uh, the manager, so-called manager. <laughs> sure, sir. You know, monk. That guy didn't know his asshole from all over his asshole all the ground. But uh, as much as I hate Roth, I do have to give him a certain amount of respect for his uh, his gun ho attitude. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's something you can learn from everybody. My dad used to tell me that. He says, "Look, this guy may be a lousy musician, but even if he teaches you what not to do, mm -hmm. then it's right. then it's right. uh, good for you." How did Edward and he get along in the early days? Like in the early the days? The whiskey days. Let's, let's talk about the whiskey. I mean, weren't you guys... It, got... In the whiskey days, it was hard to tell. I think all of us were so uh, wrapped up into our own personal uh, performance capabilities that we really didn't pay attention to what was the outside uh, influence or whatever you want to call it. We were all... We were basically stunned by the fact that there was such an interest in the band Van Halen that uh, I don't know I don't know about you but I'm just I'm a slow learner it takes me a while to get adjusted to my surroundings mm -hmm. first we're in the club and then we're in a place where you get all these people walking up uh, records and this and that and you get band members from Angel and so and so and all these people walking around and you're kind of going wow hey I'm impressed and he's just fucking hey look at this you know, so I really didn't pay attention to uh, what was going on between Dave and Ed. Mm -hmm. I do know that uh, Ed is uh, well. I'd say I, I would say Ed is about ten times or more the man than Roth will ever be. That Roth character fucked my brother's girlfriend, and I know it takes two to tango, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. and Ed it also oh. takes one to say, "Hey, look, I'm fucking your old lady. What are you gonna do about it?" Ed, Ed has told me that story, you know, and that's something I've never, ever, obviously I've never said to anyone or put in print, you know, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that Ed will allow me to, to put that in the book. I don't know if he will, but... Um, that's up to Ed. That's, that's, I agree that's up to Ed, before, but I agree with you. I think it should be. But see, I, again, um, it's so easy to say something spiteful, harmful, revenge-type, about Roth, because there's so many things you can pick from. You know, just put your put your hand in the hat, and you got a fucking you got 20 things that you can pick on. Uh, I think the approach that we're going to take, especially in in uh, view of the fact that uh, we're going to be at the uh, MTV thing, is to behave like gentlemen and to Absolutely have class and to have class. Because it's so easy to say, hey, you got you know, if somebody asks me, what do you think of Roth? I'll say he's a fucking asshole. He's an egomaniac. The guy's nuts. I'm telling you. See how easy it is? It's a lot easier to say, well, it was interesting to work with him for the last 11 years mm -hmm. and do it with a certain inflection so that at least he get oh, yeah. part of the message. Oh, yeah. 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 So, you're at the whiskey. What, what I'm going to do is, we'll go through this basically. Anytime you, you want to stop, you do like again, you know, if we want to do this in sections, I mean, you can go back home and think about what we talked about. And then I'll just I'll go back down and see what we missed, and we can go back and fill in. Okay. Whatever's cool okay, with you. This is great because this is really, this is really good stuff. A lot of this stuff I don't want to bother. I said I don't want to ask Ed what kind of pianos you play on. Listen, I feel sorry for you that you have to go edit through all this stuff. That'll be the easy part. Putting it down is the hard part, believe me. Okay. So we're at the whiskey. You guys are doing all original tunes now. Yes. Basically, I think I think one, one or two cover tunes, right. maybe something like you're uh, doing. You really got superstition. me. Superstition. Yeah. Right. 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 That's in the set. Right. I mean, running with the devil and and talking mm -hmm. about love. Right. Uh. Believe me, that was one. Believe never. me, that was the first tune that Ed ever wrote. He told me. Yeah, never came on uh, on a record. No. Which, it's a good song. Believe me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we basically did do... Uh, I said it again. <laughs> it's okay. And the reaction to the material is... It was great. Of course, it, it started again slow. Uh, nobody knew what a Van Halen was. They thought it was a shirt. <laughs> Van Heusen's brother. 
Uh, there, there were some key people, though, in the early days. I think people like Rodney Bingenheimer, did he help generate that at all? Or, or Kim Fowley? Were there people? I think to a certain extent. Um, to the extent that they came in sooner. See, had they not come along, then it would have happened anyway. Yeah. Had Gene Simmons not come along and done the, uh, the demo thing that we did in New York, had he not come along, sooner or later it would have happened. Uh, I, I really feel bad, or uh, apologetic or whatever, that it has to be this way. But the record companies just look at dollars and cents. And when they see, when you put your own show together and you got X amount of kids, they see money in it. And that's when they go. They say, okay, sign them on. All this artistic stuff, bullshit. Hmm. That's, that's my true feeling. Hmm. What were Ed's feelings about it? I mean, what did Ed... Did at Ed that time, see, this is the way I feel now. At the time, when all this stuff was happening, this was like bigger than life. This was amazing. I mean, my God, that gentleman, Mo Austin, coming to uh, the Starwood with uh, nobody there on a 99 cent night, wanting to sign the band. Uh, this was, it was amazing. So you went from the Whiskey to Starwood, Star Wars last Oh, we did, we, no, we did both. You were doing like simultaneously? Right. But you played the Whiskey before the Starwood, do you remember? I don't remember that. It was basically simultaneous. It was. Right. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the Starwood first. So you play the Starwood, it's a Sunday night, mm -hmm. you don't have any idea about the date? Or anything like that? No. Or yeah, there was no one, there was no one there. There was no one there. But well, there may be ten people at the most. But I thought you guys were sort of, I thought Van Halen had a name, anytime Van Halen played at a club down in Hollywood, they were going to draw people. At that point in time, people were very, well, just mention the name of the word Hollywood, and people would think that you're in a different sector of life. Because that's when the people started to wear makeup and, you know, alien guys, right. uh, and wear spandex and right. big heels and the whole bullshit. And you got your average person from, say, uh, from L.A. or Pasadena or Guatemala. <laughs> and they look at him and go, wow, this is kind of that's strange. But I walked in there and I go, Jesus Christ, these guys are weird. What is this crap? So it became very uh, sectioned, like I said. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, when we were playing about around that time, we auditioned at a club in Pasadena, which was the Handel Barcelona. And they said, well, you guys look too much Hollywood. Oh, this is doing Yeah. It was just, uh... anyway, it just, it just knocked us uh, flat. It was so just... so how, did the, how did that whole thing come about with, with Ted and Mo coming by? Where did, where did that contact come from? How did they know about this band that he had? I heard it was a secretary at Warner's. I mean, I don't know. It may have been. Is. It may have been. But like I said, it, it's, uh, it's just the word of mouth that uh, it just spread because we were starting to draw larger and larger and larger amounts of people to our own shows. And somehow the word got out and they came by one evening and Ted was, Ted was completely just knocked out by the way Ed played. Really? And, uh, well, the next day we signed. <laughs> uh, it was really funny though, is uh, when we did sign, uh, Ted wanted Sammy Hager to be the lead singer. Is this, he really wanted Sammy to be Uh-huh. He wanted Sammy to be the lead singer. He, he had produced Sammy, the Montrose record. Right. Sammy. And Sammy was kind of in limbo, not doing a hell right. of a lot. Right. And, um, well, because they had worked together, uh, Ted knew what Sammy can do. And, well, it, well you know, that's, that's the one thing that really ticks me off is the fact that uh, Ted waited so long to say it. He should, have, he should have told us right up front. He waited for about three or four years before he said, did you know that I originally wanted to have Sammy sing for you? Wow. Had he said something right there and then, it might have changed the course of history. Would you have said to Dave? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That's, you know, if bushes were fishes, I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So Ted and Mo came down? Yeah. That night, just the two of them? Mm hmm And after the set was over, well, he, they came upstairs and... Mm hmm 
<laughs> yeah, they came upstairs and they said, hey, it's great and uh, nice to meet you. And I mean, I was, I was half in a daze anyway. I was just kind of, my ears are ringing, my eyeballs are shut from the lights and the rest of the crap. I'm sweating about 100 miles an hour. And uh, I'm impressed that uh, the president of Warner Brothers is here and the vice president. I didn't know there were about 10 more vice presidents, but that didn't matter at the time. So. Did you ever talk to him at all? I'm oh, sure you did. I don't remember. I was, I was taking a shower. Yeah. Who was that? Who else was on that show with you? Do you know? Mm -mm. Someone said that it was Y and T. Is that possible? We have Actually, played. Actually, they were yesterday and today at that point. We have played with him before. Lenny's a good guy. He's my kind of guy. He's a slob. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the other bands that you have? Oh, I, I asked that before. Some of the Star Wars shows. I'm just trying to curious as to who the other bands are. Are the bands like Eulogy? Wasn't that like a Pasadena band? That's a Pasadena band, I right? I think you actually play with them. I have a little flyer thing you play with the show with them. Uh -huh. That called Snow. Yeah. Back already Kilowatt? Yeah. That's oh, Ed's yeah, favorite friend. <laughs> Terry Kilowatt. Terry Kilowatt. Right? Yeah. What I, I, I've talked to a few people that were that had seen the show, and they said that Terry and Ed were like these two guys, and that Terry conceivably was as good as Ed, but at some point... No, Ed, he wasn't. He, wasn't was ne he was never as good as Ed. But at Terry's some, a nice guy. He at really some point, is. Ed just got... He just went from like this level to that level. In fact, the whole, this is the whole band... The vocals, the everything just got so professional. You know, I don't know if that was a conscious thing or was just playing in Hollywood where it had to be. I'm just, you know. That is a difficult question to answer. Terry's a real nice guy, um, but he's got his head up his ass. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it is that he wants to do. Uh, he's a good player. He's fun to be with. But uh, I think what you said is, is probably correct, which is that uh, we went to a different uh, different level. He was still the, the garden, uh, the backyard party boy, and we went into a different uh, a different mode, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Didn't uh, Ted say, "Listen, I, I really like the band. I want you guys to do a demo for us." And then didn't he say, "Fuck the demo. Let's, I want to just sign you guys." You guys were sound without a demo? It was along those lines. We did go in, and uh, in about two hours, we recorded about 25 songs. I still have that tape. You do? Yeah, and it's good. Really? Uh, it's good. It's not, uh, I wouldn't say, it's not produced to the mm -hmm. point where, you know, to mm -hmm. get the full mm -hmm. thing out of a song. But uh, it's there, and Don recorded it, and it's uh, it's good. Huh. You can, uh, you can get a hold of me on my uh, Instagram page anytime, steve.rosen.guitar.pix, uh, or you can check me out on Facebook. I think if you type in Steve Rosen Tone Chaser, you'll find me there. Um, so, okay, bye.